Hello, everyone. I'm Lana Zak. We are following breaking news. The IDF says Iran has launched drones towards Israel. This is not unexpected. It's in retaliation for a strike in Syria this month that killed seven Iranian military officers at the consulate there. Iran blames Israel for that strike. Israel has not taken responsibility for it. I also want to let you know that we are hearing from the Israeli military. They say that these drones will take several hours before they are actually there. There in Israeli airspace. We have also a statement from the IDF. They said a short while ago, Iran launched UAVs from within its territory toward Israel. The IDF is on high alert and is constantly monitoring the operational situation. The IDF aerial defense array is on high alert, along with IAF fighter jets and Israeli Navy vessels that are on a defense mission in Israeli airspace. The IDF is monitoring all targets. Additionally, we heard from the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who said our defense systems are deployed. We are prepared for any scenario, both in defense and attack. We will protect ourselves from any threat, and we will do so with coolness and determination. I want to bring in now CBS News' Natalie Brand. She is at the White House. Natalie, we've been monitoring this since we first learned that Iran had pledged that they were going to uh, have retribution for those those officers that were killed uh, in what they believed to be uh, Iranian uh, sovereign territory in Syria because it was in that consulate there. President Biden has said many times that America is devoted, is devoted to defending Israel. Talk to us about what support from the U.S. looks like. Yeah, well, Lana, just to bring you up to the latest here at the White House, President Biden is now on his way back to meet with the National Security Council, the lead principals on uh, his national security team in the Situation Room to monitor the latest developments. We don't have anything further uh, about what we know about this attack, but we do know that ahead of it, President Biden once again reiterated that the United States uh, stands firmly in support of Israel, devoted to Israel's self-defense, and warned that Iran will not succeed. Uh, we also know that the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, spoke to their Israeli counterparts today and reiterated that message. Uh, from our defense team, we've we've learned that the U.S. has been uh, moving additional assets mm -hmm. to the region uh, to really bolster the protection of U.S. forces in the region uh, and try to bolster deterrence. We're also hearing from our Margaret Brennan and Pentagon uh, producer Ellie Watson that the U.S. Uh, has fighter jets on standby. Uh, Israel, as we know, says that it's been preparing for, for this attack for the worst case scenario of what uh, sources told CBS News uh, could be more than 100 drones and uh, ballistic missiles. But at the same time, experts on the region have said that while they believe Iran seeks retaliation, they also believe that Iran does not seek conflict uh, or a situation that would draw in the United States, Lana. Yes, and I just want to be clear for our viewers that those were some of the assets that Iran has, it, uh, but we do not know that all of that has, in fact, been deployed. In fact, right. the latest that we've been seeing are uh, that, that the number of drones are in the tens rather than the hundreds. Um, and we also know, as you said, Natalie, that this is a tricky time, and U.S. officials and Iranian officials have been trying to avoid war both. And we also know, additionally, uh, the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin spoke with his counterpart in Israel, reiterating U.S.'s unwavering support for Israel. As you mentioned, Margaret Brennan said that there are several U.S. assets in the area, including the Navy destroyer USS Kearney, that's positioned in the central Mediterranean, and USS Arleigh Burke, which remains in the eastern Mediterranean. And Margaret also reports that the U.S. is positioned to shoot down those drones as they are making their way now to Israel. So just to be clear for our viewers, those drones have been launched. We are not sure exactly how many there are, but that both Israel and the United States are prepared for those incoming drones and intend to shoot them down 
over the course of the next few hours. So given, Natalie, that, that the hope is that further escalation can be avoided, how is the United States planning to engage in this conflict uh, as we are seeing these drones making their way over to Israel, a major U.S. ally? And that remains to be seen because, as you've been mentioning, there's so much that we just don't know right now. Um, Margaret Brennan, from her reporting, we know that the U.S. preference here is that the Israeli government wait and assess the impact uh, of what's to come of an attack uh, and then calibrates its response uh, depending on the outcome here. Again, experts I've been talking to on the region, one Iran Iranian expert um, from the Middle uh, East Institute says that uh, really what remains to be seen is how Israel will respond to an attack by Iran. And he also noted that the Iranian regime just doesn't know whether the Biden administration has the political influence over Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, to, to uh, determine what his response will be and really uh, prevent further escalation here. There's just so many unknowns at this hour. Yes, and there's a lot of diplomacy that is also happening in addition to this. Uh, Natalie, have we heard anything from the president? Uh, when Can you tell us more about the decision that he made to cut his trip to Delaware short, to make it back to the White House there to meet with his national security teams? Well, we know that this is obviously a situation they've been taking extremely seriously. They've been monitoring uh, things changing hour by hour here. So uh, we received word this afternoon that he would, in fact, be cutting short his, his weekend trip to Delaware to return uh, and, and be here in person to consult with his national security team, the defense secretary, national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, and monitor this as it unfolds because, again, what's really key here uh, is how Israel potentially uh, responds and, and how this could uh, potentially involve the United States. Again, we don't have a new statement from the White House or President Biden as of yet, uh, but Friday he, he made clear uh, that the U.S is committed to to Israel's uh, self-defense and that it is devoted to that. He was warning Iran, uh, don't move forward with an attack. But here we are uh, today, uh, around 24 hours later, and we're just going to have to see uh, what unfolds. Yeah. The latest that we heard from the White House is that the president has been briefed on the events and is making his way over to the Situation Room where he's going to be meeting with, among others, uh, Secretary Antony Blinken, Secretary Lloyd Austin, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and, uh, and others as well. All right, Natalie, stay with us. Appreciate you joining us as we're continuing to monitor this situation from all different angles. I want to bring in now CBS News foreign correspondent Imtiaz Tayeb. He's there in Tel Aviv. Imtiaz, first of all, talk to us about what you're seeing, what you're hearing there now that we understand that, uh, that drones have been launched from Iran and are headed over to Israel. Yeah, hey, Lana, good to be with you. Well, you're absolutely right. We have confirmation from the Israeli military that those drones have been launched. Uh, we understand that they are currently in Iraqi airspace, but we also understand that these drones could likely take up to nine hours to even get anywhere near Israel. Nine hours. That's a very long time. So the question then becomes is what, at what point does Israel, which has one of the most sophisticated uh, aerial defense systems in the world, will intercept those drones? And if these are, well, they are the Iranian drones, but if they are the variety that we've seen Iran use in other arenas, uh, and this notably when it comes to Russia, Russia purchases Iranian drones, which are called Shahid drones, and they use them in Ukraine. 
and Ukraine very successfully shoots those out of the sky. So one would imagine that that is something that Israel will be able to do. Whatever the case, we have, of course, uh, been hearing from the Israeli military who say that they are monitoring the situation. Uh, we heard from, as you were saying, uh, from uh, Hagari, who was saying that uh, not only is the aerial defense array system on high alert, but so too is the Israeli Air Force, the Israeli Navy, uh, but more importantly, that they are also working in concert with uh, the U.S. as well. So there's a lot of moving parts here right now. This is, of course, concerning. But again, when we look at the timeline of how long these drones could potentially reach Israeli airspace, if they ever do, the question is, is what is Iran trying to achieve? And more importantly, is this all they're going to do or is this the beginning of what they're going to do? And again, what they're going to do because of what? This is in retaliation for that strike in Damascus at the Iranian embassy there in which 12 people were killed, including a senior uh, military commander from Iran. Since then, Iran has been vowing that it would avenge that attack, and now it's started. But again, we have many, many more questions than answers. But all we can say or what we do know for sure is that this has begun. Uh, MTS. As we have heard that that so many of the different principal actors in this want to bring down the temperature uh, on the situation. And, and given that you mentioned that Israeli defense forces are positioned uh, through the Iron Dome there to potentially take down all of these drones before they ever make it uh, into uh, to make a strike in Israel. Will that be sufficient? Do we have any sense of how much uh, retribution uh, Iran feels like they need in order to, at a minimum, save face following the killing of those military leaders. Yeah, you know, you bring up a really fascinating point, Lana, which is, you know, that's really what this is about. Iran feeling like it has to respond and it has to show this show of force. And that is what's kind of fueling this. And so, you know, when you talk about uh, there are obviously other actors involved, the U.S. a very key player in this, calling for restraint. We understand that over the past several days that the U.S. has been communicating with Iran through the Swiss embassy inside Tehran. Switzerland has an embassy in Tehran. And so the U.S. sends messages to the Swiss embassy, which then goes to the Iranian leadership, who then communicate again through the Swiss embassy back to the U.S. And we know that there has been a lot of this communication been going on. And what we understand from that communication is that both the Iranians and the U.S. have said that they do not want a major escalation, that they do not want to trigger a wider war across the Middle East, which many people say would be catastrophic. In saying that, as you so rightly point out, Iran feels a lot of pressure to do something. The question is, is will they do something beyond what we're seeing now, which is the launch of these drones from its airspace now traveling here to Israel? Again, it's going to take nine hours for those drones to get here if they ever do. And, you know, you again raise a very important point. Is that enough for destroying an embassy, which Iranians have said was an attack on their sovereignty? Because as we know, embassies are effectively uh, sovereign soil for that specific nation, uh, and if there's going to be anything more they're going to do in response to that. But again, because we know that Iran has been saying that it doesn't want to see a wider escalation, and yet its proxies are very active in the region, it's really hard to see just where this goes beyond this point. That said, it is still very alarming. The idea that Iran could potentially target inside Israel. This is one state attacking another state. That would be very serious indeed and is something that has not happened in a very long time, at least in this context. And so it would be very, very worrying indeed. Uh, MTS, for our viewers, you are there in Tel Aviv. It's about 1030, I think, at night there at this point, so late in the evening. Uh, it's going to be several hours before those uh, weapons actually make their way to Israel. What are you hearing there, as, given that especially they may land in early morning? Yeah, the mood is really interesting. You know, we obviously have been here all day and you sort of walk around Tel Aviv and things seem pretty normal. People were out and about. People were going to restaurants, at the beach, going up about their day. It's a day off today. It was Shabbat uh, for the daytime hours. So, you know, it was 
relatively quiet to begin with. But I would say that, you know, things have changed very quickly this evening. We had an announcement from the Israeli government saying that they were basically canceling school tomorrow, that people were not supposed to gather uh, in very large groups. And that sort of started trickling out more and more. And then we heard that Israel's security cabinet was joining. And now, of course, we have the announcement that this, uh, these drones have been launched from Iran. Um, so it will be interesting to see just sort of in the next day or so or in the next hours or so to see what happens and how people are going to react. But the reality is, is that people have been told, be prepared. Something is potentially happening. And that is why those um, uh, uh, rulings, if you will, or, or those requests for people to, again, as we say, don't send your kids to school, uh, don't gather in very large groups, uh, were put out, and it's hoped that people will follow those rules. Uh, but we have to understand that for six months now, since October 7th, Israel has been on, for lack of a better phrase, war footing. This is a country which is in the grips of a, of a conflict, which is dealing with what many people here say is a national trauma, which they are still living because of the hostages still inside Gaza. Uh, and of course, the fact that there is still fighting going on in Gaza. And as we know, inside Gaza, the situation there, the humanitarian situation there is pretty catastrophic as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I think the, the idea that Iran would try to launch some sort of attack on Israel is definitely alarming to people. But again, people we've been speaking to have a lot of faith in, as you say, the Iron Dome. They have a lot of faith in Israel's defense systems. They have a lot of faith in the Israeli military, even though part of that was shaken after October 7th. And there's a lot of criticisms of the Israeli military for not responding more quickly to that. Still, I think, again, because we're at this point seeing drones being launched from Iran, it's going to take many hours for there to get them. I don't get the sense of any sort of national panic or hysteria. Mm -hmm. But again, it's obviously very concerning for the president. It's very concerning for the Israeli leadership. And that is why at this moment, so many high profile and so many high level um, interactions are happening at this stage to figure out not only what's happening, but what could potentially happen next. All right, MTS, we will continue to check in with you for now. Please be safe. I want to bring in now CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazas from our Washington bureau. Olivia, we have been on standby for this. We knew that it might be happening. Even President Biden, you're looking at live images right now, has determined that he needed to come back to the White House. This is his helicopter at Joint uh, Base Andrews. Uh, the president is on his way to the security room to meet with his national security team and try and assess the situation. As we now know that there are several drones making their way from Iran to Israel and will be making their way there in the next couple of hours. So Olivia, talk to us about how U.S. and Israeli officials have been preparing for this attack. Sure, Lana. Well, as you've been discussing, this was a very telegraphed uh, response. We have effectively known since April 1st that Damascus strike that this was coming. And uh, that's why you've seen this torrent of public messaging and diplomatic efforts vis-a-vis -vis Iran. The U.S. has been remarkably transparent about what it's been seeing, what it's been hearing, and the kinds of messages that it's been delivering and receiving uh, from Iran in the run-up to this action. The Israelis, similarly, have been telegraphing their level of preparedness and what prepar preparatory steps they're taking in order to respond when they need to respond. Likewise, you've seen dozens of Western governments pick up the phone and call the foreign minister in Tehran to urge restraint, to urge caution, uh, and to, to prevent this uh, conflict from escalating regionally. You've seen, by the way, the Iranians take those calls. They feel like they're a player, and they have been effectively telegraphing and calibrating their response. All of this has been designed, of course, in order to uh, shape Iranian behavior. And I think that you are seeing that. It is very early, as we've been saying. We do not know what else is to come. But this does not initially appear to be a worst-case scenario. As we've been discussing, drones have a very long lead time. They are easy to intercept. Israel and the U.S. have excellent air defenses, and they are very much prepared for and anticipating an attack of this sort. We always expected that the Iranians would do something visible, 
uh, that they would target something with uh, an Israeli government nexus. We do not know yet what the targets are. And I'm not sure that we know that these drones are coming from inside Iran. I am waiting for confirmation on that detail, because, as we know, Iran had a spectrum of potential behaviors to reach for here. They could have uh, uh, launched things from inside of Iran. They could have enlisted its proxies. They could be reaching for targets inside Israel. They could be reaching for targets outside of Israel in, in the region. Uh, they could be uh, targeting things that are designed to incur casualties or not. Right now, and again, early stages, it appears to be at the lower end of the escalatory spectrum. We have to see if this is followed or accompanied by uh, ballistic or cruise missiles, which we know from our Pentagon team, Iran was also preparing. Um, and, uh, and I, we I thought I would say, Olivia, um, if, if you will, uh, on that question that you raised, according to the IDF, the, the drones that were launched came from within uh, Iran, Iran's own territory. But as you mentioned, this may not be the end of action. There may, there may be additional action that could come from proxies. Uh, we certainly know that Iran has supported many other groups, including Hamas, operating inside of Gaza. But uh, I want, I, as, as you're talking about um, Iran actually t heeding some of these messages that are coming from the United States, and given that there are no direct diplomatic ties between the two, what is the potential that something could go wrong, given how, how highly sensitive all of this is at this very moment? Absolutely. And, and, Lana, on that point, I would say, if, if it is indeed the case that these drones were launched from inside Iran, that is significant. Iran and Israel, despite all of their animosity over the years, have never, as far as I'm aware, and I spoke with officials about this today, directly exchanged strikes from inside their territory. So mm -hmm. that is uh, a significant development, if it is, uh, in fact, confirmed. Right. That and, that is, and that's from the IDF spokesperson, but CBS has not independently confirmed that additionally. Understood. But, right, to, I mean, Iran has often reached for its proxies in order to maintain that veneer of deniability, that it wasn't directly involved. If it's decided to drop that veneer, uh, then that, I think, uh, is notable, even if, it, if we don't know, again, uh, what else is to come and whether this is the extent of it. Uh, I think that uh, U.S. involvement here has been telegraphed. The Iranians know that the U.S. is prepared to respond defensively and, therefore, uh, are unlikely to sort of respond to defensive responses. Uh, but, of course, as you mentioned, there's a lot of room for miscalculation. There's a lot of room for emotions to intervene. There's a lot of room for political calculus. There are, of course, a lot of questions about who has an interest in this war spreading uh, and who doesn't. The mm. U.S. has very clearly uh, made its case that it is in nobody's interest uh, for this uh, to expand into a regional conflagration. I think the Iranians have long made the calculus. I spoke to uh, lots of senior uh, foreign intelligence uh, officials who have handled Iranian portfolios who have said that the supreme leader in Iran uh, is known to be risk-averse. Right now, at a moment where Iran sort of feels confident, feels like things are in the region are going in its fa favor, that uh, Israel is sort of becoming more of a pariah, or at least more isolated, why would they uh, sort of alter their risk calculus to be more risk-prone mm. rather than risk-averse? Um, again, and that's based on, uh, you know, the analysts who have looked at the supreme leader's behavior over the years. Uh, so it would be an, an interesting choice, it would be a notable choice if this became meaningfully escalatory. But again, we do not know whether this is the extent of it and what uh, the response, the nature of the response from Israel is going to be. Very interesting points, Olivia. Especially, we do know that uh, that Iran's supreme leader has pledged that retribution. Uh, remind uh, our viewers about the attack in Syria, about the military leaders who were killed in that, and why Iran is taking it so seriously, and and why they believe that Israel was responsible, though Israel has not claimed responsibility. Sure. Israel hasn't claimed responsibility, and the U.S. has, as far as I'm aware, not yet confirmed that it was, in fact, a diplomatic facility that was targeted, although indications are that it, that it was. Uh, this was a high-value target, according to the Israelis, a uh, top general within the IRGC, arguably somebody they saw as more effective on the battlefield than, for example, the Quds Force commander. They saw an opportunity, and they sought it out. I am told that, generally speaking, the Mossad is, is tasked with sort of 
doing a risk calculus before such strikes. You have a window of several hours before you have to go in order to determine what the uh, response might be. And its intelligence services would have said, OK, we think that uh, it, this is worth taking a shot. The value of removing this person from the battlefield uh, is going to exceed what we expect Iran will do in, in response. Um, that's based on conversations with intelligence officials who understand how this process works, not based on anything specific about this situation. Um, but you also know that Israel wants Iran to think that nobody who has uh, its interests or, or who works against its interests is safe anywhere. Uh, there are questions about whether the timing of this attack was particularly prudent. Uh, the U.S., of course, has said that it had no heads up that it was going to happen. Uh, I am not aware whether the Israelis have, uh, in the aftermath, sort of offered justification or their uh, internal risk calculus for taking the strike. But the fact is that it has set in motion uh, these kinds of unpredictable uh, tit-for-tats, and we'll see whether uh, that escalatory ladder goes up or down from this point. Uh, and, Olivia, appreciate all of the information and the context that you're giving our viewers in this moment. I will say I was just handed uh, a piece of paper that says that CBS News can confirm through a U.S. official that the drones were launched from within Iranian territory, which, as you point out and help us to understand, is a very big difference in how Iran has previously interacted with Israel. I know you're going to continue working the phones and speaking with your sources, and we will check back in with you. Olivia, thank you. I want to bring in now CBS News national security contributor Sam Vinograd. She is the former acting assistant secretary for counterterrorism. So, Sam, we were talking just yesterday about the heightened alert, that these warnings were coming out. Now it seems that we at least have some measure of how Iran is responding in their retaliatory action. What did your very first impressions, given that they are drones that we're hearing that were launched from within Iranian territory, and that they're going to take several hours before they make it to Israel? Well, let's just take a step back for a moment. We, anybody that knows anything about the region, about security, is going to acknowledge that this is simply an initial stage of an attack. We don't know what else may right. be coming. And I imagine, Lana, that that is exactly what President Biden is likely discussing with his principals, principals uh, in his cabinet, key national security officials, when they meet momentarily in the Situation Room. Having been in many of those meetings, typically they kick off with an intelligence briefing. In this case, it would likely be the latest and greatest intelligence on operational updates as it pertains to Iran's retaliatory attack. Number two, it would be about Iran's intentions, uh, intelligence about whether Iran intends to escalate further. And then finally, intelligence on whether there are any specific threat streams that could impact U.S. interests in the region, whether that be military facilities, embassy and consulates, or just Americans in general. After that intelligence briefing, I would imagine, in light of the fact that we now know the drones have been launched from Iran itself, the Department of Defense would likely brief the president and the rest of the national security officials in the room on what assets both we and Israel have available from an aerial defense perspective to mitigate these drones and any missiles that may also be striked. Keep in mind that these drones are flying over other countries where the United States has military assets and mm -hmm. where the United States does have capabilities to mitigate projectiles uh, overhead. So the president is undoubtedly being briefed on what we can do to help mitigate anything in the airspace on the way from Iran to Israel. And then finally, I would imagine the president is getting operational security updates on enhancements that have been made to protect Americans in the region, to include uh, force protection measures to protect military facilities, whether that's vessels or military bases, and then whether any additional assets are needed to surge to embassies and consulates in the region, primarily Israel, Lebanon, and then I would also put in there Iraq and probably Egypt, uh, whether any additional security assets are needed to protect embassies and consulates in the region if this does escalate further. So that uh, national security meeting that is about to kick off is going to be critical in terms of figuring out what assets may be deployed to keep Israel safe, Lana, but also to keep Americans safe. And Sam, on that point, what are the risks to American personnel? We know that, that President Biden has been telegraphing. Uh, and as, you, as we've been discussing, there is no direct 
diplomatic ties between the United States and Iran, but we know that he has been telegraphing that if Americans are injured in these retaliatory attacks, that that would further bring the United States into the conflict, something as a warning for Iran to try to avoid that. But how how has that message been received, and how likely is it that that American personnel could potentially be at risk? Well, there's really three ways that the president can and has been messaging to the Iranians not to mess with the United States. First, he said so publicly. Second, the United States does have private channels uh, through both the Swiss and was reported on in the press as well through the Omanis to pass messages to the Iranians. And there have been reports that both of those channels have been used to send a message to Iran not to involve the United States in whatever it is planning from a retaliatory perspective. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, the United States has also been working the phones to encourage countries who have leverage over Iran to include China to tell Iran not to escalate further and to calibrate its response. So it's a public messages, it's a messages through uh, third parties like the Swiss and the Omanis, and then it's asking others with leverage on Iran, like the Chinese who have a strong trading relationship with Iran, to tell Iran to calibrate its response. We don't know how Iran has reacted to those messages, but what we do know is that regardless of whether Iran intends to strike Americans, these missiles, these projectiles are not always totally accurate, um, despite uh, many of them being precision guided. So Americans are at risk immediately in the region based upon um, the aerial uh, activities underway. And further, more strategically, Lana, this could inspire Iranians' proxies to launch attacks against Americans in places like Iraq and Syria, where they've done that in the past, as well as individuals here in the United States, um, homegrown violent extremists, to be inspired by what they're seeing to act. So it, it is a high um, intensity moment um, based on my discussions with officials in, in the administration and my work in the administration before leaving in December 2023. There are extensive contingency plans in place and an extensive intelligence gathering apparatus that is trying to follow any specific or credible threats to Americans, whether overseas or here in the homeland. And Sam, very quickly before uh, we let you go, Talk to us about the defensive capabilities. As you mentioned, the United States has assets in the uh, geography between Iran and, uh, and Israel. In addition to Israel's um, world-famous Iron Dome, how likely is it that any of these drones will be able to actually permeate into, uh, into Israeli airspace in a way that leads to any casualties? Well, first on the Israeli side, Israel actually has a multi-layered aerial defense system. It's not just Iron Dome. They also have assets called David Sling and Arrow 1 and 2 that really want to mitigate drones, excuse me, mitigate uh, incoming uh, projectiles at various altitudes and various speeds, whether that be ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, drones, or rockets. So they have a multi-layered aerial defense system, an aerial defense array, as the IDF calls it. The United States has various assets throughout the region, including in the likely flight path of the drones from Iran to Israel, um, that could mitigate uh, those drones as well, whether it's fighter jets or other air defense systems. If Iran does launch a cruise missile from Iran, the United States also has capabilities to mitigate cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. So that is exactly why the Department of Defense has been working so closely with the Israelis, not just today, but dating back decades to ensure that we have a cohesive, multi-layered uh, air defense system to protect Israel and to protect American assets from any um, uh, incoming from Iran that could be harmful. All right, Sam, thank you very much. We'll continue to check in with you throughout the evening as well as tomorrow. Uh, now I want to bring in CBS News Face the Nation moderator and chief foreign affairs correspondent Margaret Brennan. She has been reporting all of this out. I've been quoting from her reporting throughout the day. So, uh, Margaret, what is the latest that you can tell us? Well, I, I think you know that the White House is uh, clearly messaging they are bracing for a few hours worth of attacks, that this a series of drones that were launched from Iranian territory, as a U.S. official confirmed to me, are not the extent of this reprisal attack that Iran has launched on Israel. So the more expected going to come, to, then? I, I just want to be clear on that. 
further waves of attack are expected to come over the next few hours. Mm. Yes, the drones are not the extent of it. Um, the uh, A senior White House official confirmed that the drones that already have been launched were launched from within Iranian territory. As Olivia Ghazis was uh, talking earlier, this is a, then defined as a state-on-state -state attack. This is not Iran sort of masking its actions by using some of those proxy forces, in other words, local militias scattered throughout the region who receive some level of support. No, this is a state-on-state -state reprisal. Uh, the Iranian foreign minister has been uh, posting about the calls that he has been receiving from diplomats all around the world pressing for a lack of escalation. And we are really, Lana, bracing for the next few hours in order to be able to assess the impact of any potential reprisal strike here. Uh, and we know that Israel's response, and they will respond, will be calibrated by the impact of what happens over the next few hours. And in that way, there are hopes and prayers that, that there will be limited uh, casualties from any of these strikes. And, Margaret, I I'm so glad that you referenced the, the, the significant change to how this be a state-on-state -state reprisal. As Olivia uh, was saying, she was even surprised at the initial reporting that, they that these were launched from within Iranian territory. Talk to us about how that potentially changes uh, the calculation in terms of a response from Israel and potentially from the United States, as well as other potential implications of these strikes? Well, in terms of uh, what would be uh, a benefit, essentially, to a potential impact is the fact that Israel is very ready for this kind of attack. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that they have planned and modeled for for years. They were caught blindsided by, for example, the October 7th attack and the capabilities of a, a terrorist force that they vastly underestimated. If anything, Israel is overprepared uh, in terms of an air defense system that is one of the strongest in the world, as Sam Vinograd was explaining, multi-layered in the ability to defend. Uh, but what it does do is it causes um, this state-on-state -state tension that you're removing any sense of deniability. But remember, this is Iran feeling it has to respond to what Israel did with that April 1st attack, going in and bombing what Iran says was a diplomatic facility. In Iran's view, it was Israel that made the state on state, because a diplomatic facility is defined as sovereign territory of the country it, right. it houses. So, in Israel's and Iran's view here, they're, they're looking at this through different lenses, right? So, that's where it was already defined in the eyes of the Iranians, and now it is just uh, overtly so. As uh, we were talking, though, about the militias and the proxy forces, that threat also exists. And that is a scattered and diffuse threat that is more challenging for the United States or the Israelis to be able to defend against. Mm -hmm. One of those proxy forces is Hezbollah in the north. Uh, in southern Lebanon, in northern Israel, they remain a threatening proxy force. To date, since October 7th, they have really not engaged in the way that some had feared. That's something to watch. Watch what happens with the Houthis, in particular, in the Red Sea area. That's something I'm hearing from U.S. officials, that they are very much prepared for more uh, attacks on vessels, for example, in that Red Sea area. But you also have Iraq, you have Syria, and uh, militias scattered throughout there. That's an area to watch as well. So this is uh, not a story that ends today. It's a matter of really managing the level of escalation. Margaret, I, it's such an interesting point that you make, because uh, Iran's supreme leader, the United States, Israel, there has been public messages about trying to contain this, even as uh, Iran's supreme leader said that they were going to, uh, that, to retaliate, that it was necessary. As you list all of these different disparate groups that are supported by Iran, I'm wondering what kind of power uh, the, the central government actually has over these groups and the chance for a miscalculation or one leader of one of these groups taking action that, uh, that has casualty implications that further escalate the war. 
That is one of those unknowns that worries U.S. officials the most. Uh, you put your finger on it. It is what you can't plan for. And the fact is, uh, according to U.S. officials, Israeli officials that I've spoken with as well, there isn't the same degree of command and control over some of these militias that there once was when the IRGC commander Qasem Soleimani was alive. The United States killed him in a drone attack right. uh, when he was going into uh, Iraq years ago during the Trump administration. Ever since that time, uh, the uh, military commanders who filled his shoes haven't really been able to choreograph in the same way that he did. So mm -hmm. that's not to say Iran doesn't have influence. It's just not as choreographed and controlled in the same way that it once was. And that worries uh, U.S. officials in particular because it makes it harder um, to exert pressure and uh, get some scale back there. But I should say that ever since that uh, strike that happened that killed the three American service people in Jordan, carried out by an Iranian-backed militia, we haven't seen the same um, high degree, not the same tempo of attacks by militias. And, Lana, this is a conversation that will come up again in the coming days. The prime minister of Iraq is going to walk into the White House April 15th for a serious conversation with President Biden about, among many things, the Iranian militias that operate or Iranian-backed militias that operate within his territory. And how can he counterbalance that? while still allowing for and wanting U.S. troops to remain in Iraq. There are 2,500 U.S. troops in Iraq right now. Mm -hmm. And that is an active negotiation, what happens to them next. And each of those different factors potentially having implications in this ongoing conflict. Um, uh, Margaret, I know that you have been working all of your sources. You have the best sources. What are you hearing from the White House? What are you hearing from others in terms of what the Biden administration is willing to do? Well, the United States uh, and President Biden have had this position that they will have the military back, so to speak, of Israel no matter what. But what they don't say publicly is their concern about calibrating the Israeli response. The U.S. and the Biden administration would like to watch these next few hours to be able to assess are any of these things launched by Iran, whether they are drones or perhaps missiles, later on, uh, do they make it through Israeli air defenses? If they do, what do they hit? Do they cause casualties at all? Or is enough done here that Israel can walk away and say, we can pull back, respond in a way that doesn't further escalate? It's the escalation risk that concerns the Biden administration the most here. And remember, there is a really complicated set of politics within Israel right now. Absolutely. There is a prime minister that has a strained relationship with the United States because of some of the decisions that he has made. You have uh, not only the, um, you know, the, the weight that is felt within the intelligence and military services who have been sharply criticized for failures that led to the horrific terror attack on October 7th. When they got it wrong there, there is a sense they cannot get anything wrong now. And you had the commander of uh, U.S. forces in the Middle East, General Carilla, in Israel for a reason. He could help coordinate from afar. He could help coordinate from those bases in Doha, Qatar. And instead, he's he'd flown there to really try to get inside the Israeli military mind here uh, to, to get a sense of how strong uh, this reprisal will be by Israel in the coming day or so. That is expected, that Israel will have some kind of response, uh, and to have the U.S. way in. Why? Because Israel is dependent on U.S. military backing. And this could escalate and draw the United States in, and the Biden administration is concerned about not getting pulled into this conflict in a direct way. Well, and there are also political calculations at play with that as well. Margaret, uh, I know you're eager to do more reporting on this, but I, I thought I would just read for our viewers a statement from uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and get your thoughts on it. He said, I established a clear principle, whoever hurts us, we hurt him. We will protect ourselves from any threat and we will do so with coolness and determination. When you read that, Margaret, what did you think uh, what were you reading behind between the lines? 
Well, Benjamin Netanyahu is the ultimate survivor in Israeli politics. He is the longest-serving prime minister in that country's history, and he has built a career on the promise of being able to protect the security of Israel. He has built his career on that. And he failed uh, to prevent the most horrific slaughter of the Jewish people since the Holocaust. He is being sharply criticized from his own people for that failure, which is why now, in this state-to-state -state escalation that we are seeing, there is the expectation, and it sounds like that's what he's saying in that statement, that Israel will respond. No matter what, before a single drone or missile hits it, they will respond. That is how I would understand that statement, because fundamentally, as so many uh, former military officials tell me in particular, Israel has to reestablish deterrence. They have to be able to show they are not weak in this moment of what they feel is vulnerability. The Biden administration is helping them right now because the United States has sent, as our Ellie Watson has reported, not just kept U.S. vessels and destroyers in the region. Uh, we both confirmed that the U.S. sent fighter jets. The U.S. is capable of shooting down some of these drones if President Biden ordered it as they cross through airspace. The United States could shoot these down in Syria. They could shoot them down in Iraq. There are a lot of things the United States can do to prevent anything from hitting Israel uh, in a significant way and really try to minimize that so that the expected Israeli response is not further escalatory. All right. Margaret Brennan, appreciate all of your insight and valuable reporting. Thank you. I'm going to bring in now Robert Berger. He is in Jerusalem, a CBS News contributor for us. Robert, uh, talk to us about what you're hearing there. You're on the ground and what you make of what we have learned so far, not only about this first round of attacks, but as our Margaret Brennan was reporting, the idea that there will be additional waves. There are, as far as we know already, according to what we're hearing on Israeli media, uh, another wave and maybe a third wave. And um, about 100 uh, drones are headed in this direction. Now, it's not going to be immediate, according to the Army spokesman. These drones, are, they're slow, and they may take up to eight hours to get here. Or, But still, they're preparing for the possible possibility that some of these will get through the, the defenses. The defenses include a missile defense on the ground, uh, the various anti-missile systems. There are also warplanes in the air. And, you know, Netanyahu did say that this is both defensive and offensive. And there are reports that Israel is carrying out strikes in Syria and also in Lebanon. And of course, the big question uh, is whether Israel will retaliate inside uh, Iran itself. Uh, and Robert, talk to us about the assets that the U.S. has on the ground there. The United States has— and well, by there there, Sorry, let me just clarify. By there, I mean in the region. Right. In the region, we have warships. We have a U.S. Uh, the Eisenhower Carrier Group, which is in the Red Sea. It, that includes both offensive and defensive capabilities, anti-missile, anti-drone capabilities. There are a couple of uh, destroyers here in the eastern Mediterranean near Israel. And also there are Patriot missile, anti-missile batteries and other anti-missile systems deployed across the region, I believe in Jordan and, and other places that could also help intercept uh, these incoming drones. And, Robert, uh, we were speaking earlier with Imtiaz. Uh, he was in Tel Aviv about the reaction there. Obviously, it is pretty late at night where you are there in Jerusalem. But what are you hearing in terms of how people are responding now and how people were pre preparing for these likely reprisals? Well, people are—now people are going home. A couple of hours ago, you know, they were interviewing people in Tel Aviv, and everybody was happy and drinking and having a good time. But now, uh, once the Army came out with the um, restrictions, such as uh, schools will be closed and that kind of thing, now everybody's concerned. Uh, the airport here, the international airport, is due to close down in, within the hour. So obviously, this is a very dangerous situation. People are going home, and I think I think people are calm uh, but concerned. Um, and also, it's expected that these will hit military targets and not civilian targets. These drones. So I think it's calm, but everyone is obviously very concerned. 
Thank you, Robert. I also want to just note for our viewers that in Israel, it is a regular school day on Sunday. That's something that's different from here in the United States, so might not have computed necessarily. Uh, Robert, uh, I just want to ask you, though, about the the politics that are um, are something that Margaret and I were discussing. Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister there, vowing to take appropriate response. Any sense of what that might entail? Yeah, I, I, Israel will have to, I believe, retaliate inside Iranian territory. It, you can't have an attack like this from Iran and not have Israel respond. The question is, what is Israel going to do? Will it how far will it carry its response? You know, one possibility, which is what the Israelis have been threatening to do for a long time, is to try and take out Iran's nuclear facilities. And then you would have a, really a major war on your hands, or they could try and perhaps limit it and, and close this war down in a few days. But I, no, this is a this is a game changer. We've never seen Iran fire directly from its own territory. It's always used its proxies like Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Houthis in Yemen. So I, I expect we're going to see severe re Israeli retaliation inside Iran. Very, in very interesting. We appreciate uh, all of the insight that you're providing. As we understand it, officials in Jordan have also declared a state of emergency as Iran's attack on Israel is now making its way across the uh, Middle East. Local media reports that the nation closed its airspace to incoming, outgoing and transit flights. We're going to bring back in CBS News foreign correspondent MTS Tayeb. He's there in Tel Aviv. MTS, I want to talk to you now about the timing. Shabbat just ended there in Israel. Passover begins on Monday. Uh, for, for Muslims, the uh, Ramadan just ended on Friday. It seems like there was this one opportunity that, uh, that Iran potentially had to, to undertake these attacks without falling on a holy day for either Jews or Muslims. Is that something that, that potentially was at play? Look, things are tense here at the best of times, right? There, right. you know, as well as sort of being, you know, this complicated region with all of these actors and players. We have this war going on in Gaza. There's obviously all of these other considerations. You know, this is uh, the Holy Land, for lack of a better phrase. But I think when it comes to Iran, when it comes to this decision that was made to launch these drones and potentially even more than that. In fact, we've been monitoring Iranian state media and the language they're using is quite interesting. They didn't just say or confirm that drones drones were launched, they also used the word missiles as well. Now, what that means, we don't know. We don't have any reports that missiles have been launched from Iran. Uh, but if that is part of the longer strategy, as this night progresses, it could be potentially very concerning. But to answer your broader question, look, it's very clear that after that embassy attack in Damascus, when, and this is U.S. Uh, you know, government confirming that when Israel targeted the Iranian embassy in Damascus, and you see those images, that building was completely destroyed. A number of people were killed, including a very senior Iranian military commander that Iran felt it needed to respond in a considerable way. And, of course, they said so. They said, we will respond. This was a violation. And now we have these drones that are on their way. And I just want to read to you very quickly a statement we've uh, just received from the Israeli military, uh, from uh, the Israeli military spokesman, spokesman Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari. He said, and again, I'm quoting here, Iran has launched a direct attack from Iranian soil towards the state of Israel. We are closely monitoring, and again, I'm quoting here, Iranian killer drones that are en route to Israel sent by Iran. This is a severe and dangerous escalation. Our defensive and offensive capabilities capabilities are at the highest level of readiness again ahead of this large-scale attack from Iran. That coming from Israel's uh, main military spokesperson describing it as a large-scale attack. But again, as we've been saying, Lana, you know, these drones, as far as we know, uh, 
you know, will take quite a while to get here, at least at nine hours to travel all the way from Iran to Israel. And as we've been hearing from Margaret and from others, it's very likely that the U.S. could intercept those. We've also been hearing that the Jordanians have suggested that they may intercept those drones. And that's because Beyond Israel, there are actors in this region, including the U.S., of course, Jordan, which neighbors Israel, who do not want to see a wider escalation spread across this region. It is deeply concerning to them. But the reality is, is for the first time, Iran has overtly carried out a strike towards Israel. That in itself is extremely significant. And as we've been hearing, Israel will feel compelled to respond whether or not these drones these drones rather even make it here. Lana. Um, as we're talking about the necessity of response for foreign governments, uh, I'm reminded of the January drone strike that killed American personnel. Uh, that was those were also Iranian drones. Remind us just in terms of context, MTS, about some of the major things that happened between October 7th and today that led us to this point. Yeah, look, in we have this awful war unfolding in Gaza. We have over 30,000 people killed, the majority of them women and children. And it is horrendous. We've had the October 7th attacks in which 1,200 Israelis were killed. Uh, we've had so much pain in that very specific sphere. But if you widen the aperture, we've seen regionally the region really become shaped by this. To the north, you have Israel's border with uh, Lebanon, in which almost daily, daily, they've been trading fire with Hezbollah, which, of course, is very much aligned with Iran, backed by Iran. We've also had the Houthis in Yemen, who have been targeting shipping vessels in the Red Sea. Uh, in fact, just today, doing a ship, we understand, is uh, owned by uh, an Israeli billionaire. We've had other strikes on U.S. forces, as you rightly point out, across the region, proxies that are backed or supported by Iran. All of this has been happening at the same time. And though it's been extremely concerning for anyone and, more importantly, has been made I articulated very clearly, specifically from President Biden, who has said he does not want to see this conflict in Gaza spread across the region, we now have these drones being launched from Iran towards Israel. And the fear is that amidst all of these other things that have happened, that this could be that match that really inflames the region. But as we've been hearing again from the president himself, again, we've heard, you know, from the Iranian leadership saying that they don't want to see an escalation, but that they had to respond to Israel's attack on their embassy inside of Damascus, causing those casualties, destroying that building. Again, that's just by way of explanation, what mm -hmm. Iran says. And so all of this happening all at once has really had this region on edge, for lack of a better phrase. And the, again, the concern is, is this the tipping point? Are we going to see this conflict spread and other countries become involved? And that, of course, would be disastrous on so many le levels for so many people. And it's obviously understandable why President uh, Biden doesn't want to see something like that happen. But we have to consider that Israel and the Israeli leadership are also watching this saying we have to now respond to this too, that we are now being directly targeted by another state. And whatever happens, however, you know, if these drones even reach Israel, it still was launched towards and directed at Israel and that they will have to do something. And so it is extremely worrying. It's very alarming. And the next few hours will tell us a lot about what could potentially happen next. Lana. MT, as you referenced, uh, something that, honestly, in, the, um, in all the discussions that we've had so far uh, in this, in this um, time period since learning about the launch of those drones, we haven't even discussed. I'm hoping you can tell our viewers more about uh, the paramilitary Revolutionary Guard um, seizing that container ship in the Straits of Hormuz and uh, about how that is also 
something that just happened today, Saturday, and how that fits into yeah. this larger picture. Yeah, I mean, it just speaks to the fact that this, what happened on October 7th and everything that's happened since isn't getting quieter, it isn't calming down, it is doing the opposite. It is becoming more fraught, more intense, more alarming, and more concerning. All, what we're seeing is escalation. And the Biden administration from the very beginning has been trying to contain this. You remember back in October, uh, we heard that the Biden administration, or we learned later, had to work extremely hard to, to really deter the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu not to not only go into Gaza, but to potentially launch an assault against Hezbollah in the north. And as we've been saying, there's been relatively low-level conflict. Some would argue of slightly more than low-level, but there's, it's not been to the extent that, of course, we've seen in Gaza, but that the president really was able to convince Prime Minister Netanyahu to not also go into Lebanon as well, again, because of this concern of this becoming a regional war, a regional conflict. Uh, but... The war in Gaza is now over six months. We've seen the devastation there. We've seen the high civilian casualty. Uh, and so across the region, you have Arab countries looking with their population saying, what are you doing about Gaza? What are you doing about Israel? Again, by way of explanation. And... And so Iran, which, again, has been involved in so many of these proxy battles with Israel, with the U.S. and elsewhere, the fact that it was so directly targeted by Israel in Damascus, again, as we've been saying, it felt so compelled that it needed to do something. But as we've been saying, the real fear here is that as all of these things happen at once, could this lead to something more serious? And the short answer is, is we just don't know, because whatever happens in the next couple of hours, it's really then up to Israel to decide what Israel wants to do. And that is why the U.S. is so closely, working so closely with the Israelis, of course, this, you know, rock-steady relationship. But more importantly, again, everything that we've seen from the president, everything we've heard is that what they want to prevent is a wider regional conflict from spreading. And I'm more than certain that when President Biden speaks with President Netan or Prime Minister Netanyahu, and we don't know if they have spoken to each other directly yet, that he will be pe appealing for calm, to de-escalate the situation and to not let this spread into a regional war. Mama. All right. MTS, thank you. I want to bring in now CBS News contributor and former chief of operations in the CIA's counterterrorism mission center, Andrew Boyd. Andrew, these drones are on their way to Israel. So what do you anticipate this escalation will mean? Uh, so good evening. Uh, and, and we, again, as, as our colleagues have been saying, uh, we're trying to avoid escalation. But because there's a lot of uh, unknowns and uncertainty as to where these hundred uh, potentially 100 plus drones are heading, um, we can assume that there, there will be escalation. Again, this could be the lead element of a wider attack. We're focusing on these 100 drones. Um, but in fact, this could be a lead element of a broader attack, including rockets and missiles of, uh, into northern Israel from Lebanon, from other proxies, Shia proxies inside Iraq. Um, one thing is for certain that the Israelis are prepared for this. Uh, Central U.S. Central Command, and, and has, been, has been noted, General Carilla, the commander of Central Command, is in the area. Uh, so, so the Israelis are prepared for this. Uh, the U.S. forces in the region are prepared for this. Uh, but there's a lot of unknowns. For, uh, as far as escalation goes, um, we'll have to see over the next uh, 12 to 24 hours what, what this all means. But there is a significant potential for an escalation into a broader uh, regional conflict, which, again, uh, President Biden and his entire administration want to avoid. And on that front, uh, we heard from our colleagues that the Jordanians may potentially try to shoot down some of these incoming drones. Egypt has traditionally played a role in trying to de-escalate conflict in the region. How do you expect some other countries to respond to this? So, so shooting out the, the drones, I mean, many of these drones are slow moving. They're subsonic. Um, so, so the Jordanians could shoot them down. Again, we've seen uh, in, in the context of Ukraine, Ukrainians are, are successful in shooting down a number of these Iranian manufactured 
uh, or Iranian model drones used by the Russians. That being said, it's it's a mass attack. A hundred, and again, we keep hearing the term a hundred, but there there could be more, and there could and, and they could overwhelm very easily overwhelm the air defenses of Israel and Israel's uh, neighbors, such as Jordan. I mean, the Jordanians have a very strong military, uh, but their 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 counter missile capabilities are limited. Um, and, and the Jordanians don't want to use all of their counter uh, drone, counter missile capabilities uh, on just this one attack, or else they'll, they'll be out of anti-aircraft capability. Uh, and Andrew, um, I want to pick up on something that you that you said that these are slow moving subsonic drones. We also heard from MTS that Iranian state media is re is reporting that in addition to the drones that there are also missiles uh, that were sent. But in in the case of the drones, at least given that they are slow moving, given that it will take hours and that they are potentially more easily taken out before causing any casualties. Do you see that as an indication that Iran needed to, to take retaliatory action, but is in fact trying to de-escalate this conflict to the best of their ability? So, so that is in pattern with how the Iranians, after, the, uh, after Qasem Soleimani was killed, they did signal quite a bit uh, to the United States that an attack was coming. Now, granted, it, wasn't, it was not a drone attack against U.S. bases in Iraq. It was a ballistic missile attack, which—, which it is supersonic and travel, obviously travels at quite quite a fast rate. If if the Iranian uh, attack against Israel is limited to a hundred slow moving sub subsonic drones with fairly limited explosive capability, uh, and, and it ends at that, uh, per perhaps that is the Iranian signal. Yes, let's not escalate beyond, beyond this, and that's all we're intending to do. The problem with that is. If those hundred drones land in, in Tel Aviv in, in a populated area and kill civilians, hit a hospital, uh, it, you know, hit a concentration of Israeli civilians, I, I mean, I, I don't think the Netanyahu government will have any uh, alternative other than to further retaliate against the Iranians. And the prime minister has said as much. Um, let's talk a little bit, though, about timing, Andrew. I was speaking with MTS about religious calendars, um, but this also comes in the context of Israel uh, intending to have a ground invasion in Rafah, uh, being dissuaded by the United States and other international actors trying to, uh, to minimize casualties in Gaza. Do you think that in any way that this is Iran trying to redivert attention uh, away from uh, from that potential military action by Israel? Uh, no, I, I really don't. I mean, I think this is solely tied uh, to the attack in Damascus uh, against the facility uh, adjacent to the uh, Iranian embassy uh, in Damascus and the fact that uh, the, the a very senior IRGC Quds Force officer was killed, along with several other officers. I, I, this is directly tied to the, tied to that, uh, and and a need, and a need in the minds of the of the Iranian government uh, that they needed to retaliate against against that that uh, alleged uh, Israeli attack. Uh, the Iranians have really tried to to stay out of uh, the conflict between Israel and Hamas. And any linkage be between the the two, I think, would would be a supposition that just wouldn't wouldn't fit with Iranian behavior. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and you didn't say a alleged attack by Israel on that embassy in Damascus. Um, Israel has not claimed responsibility for it. Obviously, Iran wholly uh, has is holding Israel responsible. Does it matter at any uh, in any way that Israel has not claimed responsibility um, or? So, well, so, so in the history, help our viewers understand that aspect. So, of so, it. so yes, you, you make a very good point. Uh, but in the history of Israel's conflict with Syria, and then with with the Iranians uh, and the Iranian proxies in Syria, uh, th there there has there has always been uh, a denial, or the Israelis just have never uh, acknowledged it. So my my point on on the alleged attack, yes, is is my is that the Israelis have never acknowledged that they did attack. That facility. Now there is a number. There's no one else who could claim responsibility. But um, the, the bigger debate about that facility is what it was, and 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 the Iranians are claiming it was a consulate. Uh, I, I lived in Damascus uh, as a diplomat. Um, actually, I lived on, in that neighborhood, um, and and I, I the Iranians have used that facility and and the embassy for for their activities, su supporting Hezbollah, supporting other. 
uh, Shia militia groups around the region. Uh, so to, to reference it as a consulate, a consulate that issues visas as a consulate, the United States consulates worldwide would, it is a bit of a stretch. So I, that, that argument is a bit spurious on the Iranians' part. But you know, the fact of the matter remains that the Israelis have not acknowledged that that was their attack against that facility that I say in quotes the Iranians uh, claim as a consulate. Andrew, appreciate that, that insight. I want to ask you about one other thing, because critics of the Biden administration would point to their decision to release uh, those funds in, uh, in terms of a humanitarian, um, a humanitarian release of the funds back to Iran. In fact, we heard that from the former president, Donald Trump, in his criticism of the Biden administration just uh, yesterday evening. Is that, in fact, a, a factor in this in any way? I, I really don't think so. I mean, it, you know, uh, diplomatic negotiations are what they are. Uh, 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 foreign states, adversary states like the Iranians put, put terms on those negotiations. Uh, the Biden administration saw that that was an, uh, an important negotiating uh, tactic to, to offer those funds. The Iranians have plenty of other funds to, to fund their, their nefarious activities throughout the region, the funding uh, of Hezbollah and other, uh, other groups like that. One specific check, so to speak, is not going to make a demonstrable difference to Iranian intent uh, in the region. And if you'll bear with us for just a second, it looks like we have a statement from the Iranian embassy in London. It's a formal statement. Uh, it says, in retaliation for the heinous actions committed by the Zionist regime, which included an assault on the consular section of the Iranian embassy in Damascus and the loss of Iran's military leaders and advisors, the aerospace force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps launched a punitive strike against the occupied territories. This operation involved the use of both missiles and drones, aiming to hold the illegitimate and criminal regime accountable. Uh, the language that they use is in some ways to be expected from Iran, but what do you make of that statement, Andrew? So, so back to our, our, our earlier uh, uh, discussion, uh, I mean, I think they're trying to get ahead of this with a public relations message, so to speak, that implies that this is a bounded attack, that they are trying to, they're not trying to de-escalate, obviously, but they're trying to to keep this to go, not go beyond where they currently are in this conflict. Um, if in fact um, they are successful in, 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 in bounding their, their retaliation, uh, I think that'll be a good thing for the entire region and, and for, for the United States of America as well, and definitely a good thing for the, for Israel. But they're really playing with fire in my mind, uh, the, the Iranian government, because where those drones land and where they detonate. And where the miss and if in fact there are ballistic missiles, because because honestly the, the 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 lag time between a ballistic missile launch and impact, I mean I think we'd already be there if in fact they had lost ballistic uh, launched ballistic missiles. Mm -hmm. So so I'm I'm you know, I'm skeptical even on that. But let's just for argument's sake say there are ballistic missiles inbound to, to Israel and a hundred drones. It, the question is where they're going to impact, and, and 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 if they kill Israeli civilians. Um, and if they land in downtown Tel Aviv, if they hit important uh, uh, locations in Jerusalem, uh, I, I really think the Iranians may have may have overplayed their hand. All right, but Andrew. Only, we'll, time, only time will tell on that. And we will be watching uh, over the next few hours in particular. Andrew Boyd, the former chief of operations in the CIA's counterterrorism mission center. Appreciate all of your insight. For now, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a few minutes with the very latest. Welcome back to our continuing coverage of the retaliatory attacks launched by Iran against Israel. I'm Lana Zak. Drones have been launched from Iranian territory. That marks the first time that that has happened. It is significant on multiple levels. They are now en route to Israel. As we just heard from our colleagues at BBC News, some of those drones are believed to have been shot down at this point. CBS News has learned that the U.K. scrambled jets from Cyprus to also participate in the defense of Israel. A statement from Downing Street is expected shortly. We are hearing that Jordan is also participating in Israel's defense, but we are waiting to independently confirm that. Joining us now from Jerusalem is CBS News contributor Robert Berger once again. Robert, an official, has told CBS News that anything passing over Jordanian territory will be intercepted. A U.K. official confirms that those British jets have been scrambled uh, from Cyprus. So what does all of this mean in terms of a response from the Middle East? 
Well, you know, it seems that Israel really isn't alone here. I mean, the British are scrambling jets, as you said. We're also hearing reports that, that the United States forces have also intercepted some of these drones. I uh, can't confirm that, but that's what's going around. Mm -hmm. So you have also Israeli defenses, and now the British appear to be involved. You have American defenses. The Jordanians don't want drones flying over their airspace. The Egyptians have just expressed concerns. So um, there's a lot of defense going up around Israel and within Israel, but still, you know, this is a, this, this is a real um, game changer because it's the first time Iran has actually fired uh, from its own territory. And this is really a massive attack, more than 100 drones. And there are even reports that I, I'm just saying on, Isra on Israeli media that Iran has fired ballistic missiles at Israel. Again, reports from reports Israeli that media. Are, yes, that are at this point unconfirmed, but CBS News diligently working to confirm all that. Obviously, with breaking news, we're trying to sort out fact from fiction. Robert, we also see uh, um, a statement from France's foreign minister saying, quote, France reaffirms its attachment to Israel's security and assures of its solidarity. So as you point out rightly, the rest of the world seems like it is mobilizing to try and mitigate the impact of these drones on their way now to Israel. And UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak put out a statement that condemned the Iranian regime, saying that the UK will stand up for Israel's security. Talk to us just a bit about how important the UK's alliance to Israel is in terms of this greater conflict. You know, what's interesting is that, you know, these countries, the UK, the United States, and others have really been uh, pressuring Israel on the Gaza war and, and the Palestinian issue. But now when it comes to Iran, which is really seen as a regional threat that everyone can agree on, at least in the West, um, th this is very important to have the, um, the allies, if you will, the United States, UK, France, now lining up and backing Israel against Iran. I, I want to almost underline what you said, Robert, because there has been more criticism of the strategies that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has employed in Gaza, the massive number of civilian casualties over there. But when it comes to an attack on Israel by Iran, we're seeing all of those allies who were perhaps putting pressure on Israel to change course now coming to Israel's defense. So what are the next steps for Israel? I don't see uh, how the how Israel wouldn't retaliate inside Iran for this attack. I mean, you, again, this is a big attack. This is a major attack, more than 100 drones, uh, perhaps missiles as well. Um, I, I, I think we'll perhaps we'll wait. Israel will wait and see how many of these get through the defenses, how many drones, if any attack, mm -hmm. if any land in Israel, if people are killed, that could also help determine the response. But even if, let's say, not a single drone gets through, I don't see how Israel can sit by and allow this attack to happen without retaliating inside Iran. And then the question is, how severe that retaliation inside Iran would be. And Robert, as we're discussing the necessity of all of these leaders to retaliate after an assault on their sovereign territory, it's worth reminding our audience that Iran said that this is in response to what they believe to be attacks by Israel on the Iranian uh, consulate space in Syria. Some of those acute, uh, accounts are disputed, I, I will mention, and, uh, and Israel, for their part, has not taken responsibility for it. But if, in fact, Israel had attacked uh, these Iranian military leaders in Damascus, they must have known that Iran would respond or feel compelled to respond. Does this seem like a, a miscalculation by the IDF, then? Well, some analysts would say that. Uh, some people think that maybe Israel crossed a red line. But, you know, the Israelis have for a long time have been targeting various Iranian assets. They've targeted uh, the nuclear facilities with sabotage. They've targeted drone facilities with sabotage. They've been hitting Iranian targets inside Iran. It seems like this attack, this alleged attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus was maybe the straw that broke the camel's back. And now uh, 
perhaps, if you want to call it a miscalculation. A, a lot of people here also think now that Iran has miscalculated. Hmm. The feeling was that that Iran would probably strike back through its proxies like Hezbollah and Lebanon and uh, the Houthis in Yemen. By the way, there are also reports that the Houthis are, are, are firing uh, in this direction as well. But um, yeah, a miscal miscalculation on both sides can now even escalate this for further. And as the U.S. and other allies uh, and even non-allies of Israel are working to try and de-escalate this conflict, talk to us, Robert, about how the U.S. is likely to respond. Well, I believe we're going to we're hearing that U.S. forces are actually involved in intercepting some of these drones that are coming in. So already it appears I, I, I can't confirm this, but. It appears that the U.S. is involved in, in stopping this attack, as well as the U.K. And um, I, But, you know, the U.S. obviously doesn't want this to really escalate further into a major regional war. So perhaps it will try to restrain Israel's response. Um, I don't I think that's going to be hard to do. Uh, after, but I, I, I imagine that that America's plan would be to try and contain this to a, a, a relatively to a tit for tat and try and leave it at a certain point uh, and not escalate this into a long regional war. All right, Robert Berger, thank you. Thank you. Now I want to head back over to CBS News contributor and former chief of operations in the CIA's counterterrorism mission center, Andrew Boyd. So, Andrew, let's start off given your experience with the CIA. Talk to us about how the CIA and Mossad will work together in the wake of these attacks. So, so again, we have a close, uh, we, my former employer, have a, uh, have a close uh, relationship, intelligence sharing uh, and whatnot. So, so CIA and Mossad be deeply uh, involved in this. But right at this very moment, uh, this is a military operation and the, and the collaboration is between uh, the IDF and the Department of Defense principally Central Command and its subordinate commands uh, under General uh, Eric Carrilla. But throughout throughout the war on terror and, and, and both, you know, terrorist attacks directed against the United States and its forces or terrorist attacks directed against Israel and its forces, there's been deep collaboration between CIA and Mossad. And Andrew, uh, Iranian state television is reporting that in addition to these drones, that there were also ballistic missiles that were launched. How does that potentially change how um, Israel and others are, are viewing this attack? So, so again, I mean, I don't think people are saying that, that there's ballistic missile attacks. Again, if there was a ballistic missile launch uh, when this reporting started, I, I think there would have been impacts in Israel by now. So, so we have to just wait and see on that. But the reality is that ballistic missiles are much more targetable than drones. Uh, I mean, again, drones, uh, you can target them, but their accuracy is not quite as substantial. And the warhead on a drone is going to be significantly smaller than most ballistic missiles. Rockets have a smaller uh, uh, warhead as well. But if there are ballistic missiles launched from Iranian soil toward, towards Israel, that would be a significant escalation beyond just 100 drones uh, being launched. But again, I, I think time will tell whether that is a misunderstanding of what happened or a just a propaganda statement from the Iranian government. I wondered about that because the reports are coming from the state-run media in Iran. Uh, the United, neither our source in the United States or CBS News has been able to independently confirm that. What we do know are that these, uh, that these drones, I believe that they are the slow-moving Shahad 136 bomb carrying drones are on their way and, and several of them we believe have already been shot down. Andrew, uh, I'm wondering how the United States strategy with Iran uh, may shift. Obviously, we don't have diplomatic relationships. It is a, uh, a, a tenuous relationship at best. But how how might those relationships uh, change as a result of this attack? So, so I don't think our strategic intent on our Iranian relationship will change. I mean, we have uh, goals that are consistent for the security of the United States when it comes to an adversary uh, like Iran. Our tactics may change. 
and, and our, our diplomatic uh, approaches to both Israel and, and its neighbors, the Jordanians, uh, and, and our, our own partners, such as the, the British, may, may change. Because, again, if, in fact, these weapons do impact Israel and are not all shot down, which we, we hope that the drones and if there's any ballistic missiles, that, that they're all shot down. But if they're not, and they impact Israel, and they kill is Israeli civilians or, or Israeli uh, military members, we, we all have to remember this will be the very first atta Iranian attack uh, on, on Israeli territory that hasn't gone through a proxy, you know, name your proxy, Hezbollah, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and then the various group, groups uh, uh, in Iraq, the Shia groups in Iraq. Um, that, that would be a game changer. And, and, I, and I don't know if, if the Netanyahu government they would have to do something in retaliation to the Iranians. So, so our strategic end state uh, from the United States government perspective will not change, but how tactically we go about trying to prevent an escalation. And I think, you know, thought uh, discussions about uh, the drones being shot down by U.S. forces, by Jordanian forces, is part of the tactical uh, plan to, to, to try to prevent an escalation beyond what is absolutely necessary. And I want to um, I want to ask you about what I heard from a former Israeli official on BBC. He said that this is the dawn of a new day in the Middle East, that things have changed uh, significantly. And this is by far, uh, given, as we were discussing, the significance of these attacks originating in Iran rather than one of these proxy groups. Uh, one of the biggest escalations in the Middle East that we've seen in decades. I'm wondering, given that Israel is already fighting Hamas in Gaza. It has problems in the West Bank and Hezbollah. Can it actually engage on a third front in an actual hot war with Iran? Well, again, let, let, let's, uh, you know, the, the, the comments from the former uh, Israeli government uh, official aside, let, let, let's hope it's not the dawn of a completely new day. Absolutely. Just dawn of an dawn of another day, because um, you know, whether or not Israel can, can, can fight a three-front war, you know, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, and the Iranians is, is one point. But, but, but can the United States avoid being dragged into such a regional conflict? So, so, so again, we, we, uh, we being the, the, the United States and the, and the Biden administration absolutely does want, not want a new day to dawn and wants to, to you know, w w with the forces we have in the region, uh, helping the Israelis. Uh, and with our partners in the region, such as the Jordanians, try to prevent uh, that escalation. But again, if these weapons do impact uh, in Israel and and they do kill Israeli civilians and or and or is Israeli military members, um, we will then take another tactic and tr try to to try to negotiate with our our Israeli friends to ensure that they don't escalate beyond what is absolutely necessary. Again, the Netanyahu government has has a lot of bruises since October seventh. Uh, and, and trying to erase the memory, uh, so to speak, uh, of that horrific uh, incident where, where, you know, 1,200 Israelis were murdered by Hamas and then several hundred more were, were kidnapped. I mean, one of the ways in, in, in the history of military conflict and political uh, problems is to start another conflict. And again, in this case, would be with Hezbollah, with Iran, to get to erase the, those, those uh, issues that the Netanyahu government has since October 7th. We would really, uh, that would be a, a huge mistake, uh, I, I believe, for the Netanyahu government to utilize this Iranian attack, especially if it is in a very limited impact, to then use that as an excuse to broaden their war uh, to Hezbollah or to actually Iranian territory. Uh, because I really think the consequences of, as consequences of that, no one can predict. Absolutely. And even as we discuss the worst cases uh, that are potentially uh, in the future, we all are hoping for the best cases. I also want to note that we now have confirmed from our sources that President Biden's meeting in the Situation Room has now begun with his advisors. Uh, Andrew, what are some of the conversations that are going to be taking place there? Uh, so, so President Biden's national security team will be talking about various scenarios that could unfold over the next couple hours, the next 12 hours, the next 24 hours, and what various options uh, they would endorse both for our, our commander in the field, the, in this case, uh, General Kirill, the, the commander of uh, Central Command, but also what the diplomatic dialogue will be with the Israelis 
and all of the partners uh, in the region. As has been discussed, there's been uni unanimity on, with, amongst our allies, the French, uh, the, the United Kingdom, uh, the Jordanians, of, of opposing this attack. Even uh, we, we've heard that there have been jets uh, launched from Cyprus, uh, British jets, to help intercept uh, the drones. So there's going to be a mass of, of diplomatic engagement at our em embassies in the region. But the guidance as, as, as to what we do from a diplomatic messaging perspective and what the United States does uh, from a military perspective will all come out of that meeting that the president and his team are currently engaged in. All right. Andrew Boyd, thank you. Thank you. We will have continuing coverage on the drone attacks, even as we continue to sort through some of these other reports. And CBS News will work to confirm all of that for you and bring you the very latest. So stay with us for the latest developments. I'm Lana Zak. We'll be right back.